Hello, and welcome to Settle the Stars, Episode 17, Pluto and the Dwarf Planets. Hey folks, this is Alexander Wynn. Last week, we completed our tour of the solar system's planets and moons, but our complete exploration of the solar system at large is far from over. There's an entire class of large bodies circling our sun at the farthest reaches of the solar system that could almost be, or in Pluto's case, once were, considered planets with a range of unique features and characteristics. These objects can teach us a lot about the solar system and how it formed. This week, we'll take a tour of Pluto and discuss some of the similar bodies that aren't quite as famous. We'll see what effect the extreme dark and cold can have on these distant worlds and take a closer look at some of the technologies that have helped teach us so much about them. Following the discovery of Uranus in 1781, we discussed previously how discrepancies in its orbit from the carefully calculated predictive tables published by Alexis Bovard led to a hypothesized planet that turned out to be Neptune. As astronomers began to study Neptune, they realized that its presence didn't quite resolve all of these discrepancies. Astronomers therefore believed there may be another, still unidentified planet, affecting the orbit of Uranus. In 1906, American astronomer Percival Lowell of the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, launched an ambitious project to identify this unknown ninth planet, which he named Planet X. Like the race to find Neptune, teams of astronomers began calculating hypothetical coordinates for this object and scanning the skies for confirmation. In 1916, Lowell died, and his project concluded without success, although it would later be discovered that he had in fact captured two images of the planet on March 19, 1915, without realizing what he had found. There's no shame in that mistake, however. As it turns out, Pluto eluded recognition in 14 other observations by Yerkes Observatory in Wisconsin in 1909. The search would resume 20 years later, when the new director of Lowell Observatory gave the task of finding Planet X to a young astronomer named Clyde Tombaugh. Just 23 years old, Tombaugh was given the unenviable task of reviewing thousands of images of the sky using a blink comparator, which rapidly switches images back and forth to produce the illusion of movement for any objects that change location between snaps. Tombaugh spent almost a year reviewing these images, and on February 18, 1930, he discovered a possible moving object from images taken the previous January. After confirming its presence in other photographs, news of the discovery was telegraphed to Harvard College Observatory on March 13, 1930, with headlines blasting the news around the world, Planet X had been found. Winning the right to name this new planet, Lowell Observatory received thousands of suggestions from around the world, including several from Percival Lowell's widow, Constance, who proposed naming the planet after herself. Eventually, Pluto was suggested by an 11-year-old schoolgirl from Oxford, England, with an interest in classical mythology named Venetia Burney. Pluto is the Roman god of the underworld, corresponding to the Greek god Hades. Lowell Observatory scientists were allowed to vote on the final name from a short list of three finalists. Minerva, which had already been used to name an asteroid. Cronus, which had been suggested by the controversial and unpopular astronomer Thomas Jefferson Jackson C. And Pluto. Pluto won by a unanimous vote, and Venetia was awarded five pounds sterling, a windfall for an 11-year-old worth about 450 US dollars today. The name was quickly adopted globally, inspiring chemist Glenn T. Seaborg to name the newly discovered plutonium for the new planet. Other cultures and languages adopted their own localized names for the planet, most following the example by attributing the planet to a god or spirit of the underworld, darkness, or the dead. The difficulty of resolving an image of the planet from Earth complicated the study of Pluto for many years. Initially, its mass was extrapolated from the apparent gravitational effects on Uranus and Neptune, which estimated a planet around the size of Earth, much smaller than the seven times Earth predicted by Percival Lowell. As more data were collected and composition was guessed from the brightness of the planet, revisions downward in size continued until it was about one one-hundredth as massive as Earth. Finally, the discovery of the nearby object Charon in 1978 allowed for the best estimate yet based on the calculations of their interactions, which placed Pluto at around 1 650th the mass of Earth. 
a planet of such small size would undoubtedly not account for the discrepancies observed in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune, and speculation for an alternative Planet X reignited. It would take the visit of Voyager 2 to settle the matter. New data from the spacecraft demonstrated that Neptune's size had been overestimated by about 0.5%. By calculating the interactions of the planets using the revised mass, the discrepancies in orbit vanished, along with speculation for an unidentified planet. Pluto was determined to lie an incredible distance from the Sun, with an eccentric oval-shaped orbit that brings it closer to the Sun than Neptune at about 4.4 billion kilometers, or 40 times farther from the Sun than Earth. At its most distant, Pluto is almost twice as far, at 7.4 billion kilometers from the Sun. It was the first object to be found in a new belt of dwarf planets, ice, and rock called the Kuiper Belt, after the Dutch astronomer Gerard Kuiper. Kuiper did not discover the belt, but he did predict its existence after Pluto was discovered in 1930, but wouldn't be confirmed until 1992, when other objects were discovered at a similar distance, many of them comparable in volume to Pluto. The discovery of these objects prompted controversy over Pluto's status as a planet, and in 2006, the International Astronomical Union refined the definition of the term planet, which had previously had no formal definition, to include the following criteria. First, the object must be in orbit around the Sun. Pluto's orbit may take a while at 250 years, but it does come back around eventually. Check. Second, the object must be massive enough to be rounded by its own gravity, as defined by hydrostatic equilibrium. While difficult to resolve, the shape of the object was conclusively determined to be spherical, matching the most accurate estimates of its mass. Check. Third, the object must have cleared the neighborhood around its orbit. Pluto is much smaller than the combined mass of the other objects in its orbit, only about 7% as massive. By comparison, planet Earth is 1.7 million times as massive as the remaining mass within its orbit, excluding the moon. No check. Pluto was officially downgraded from planet to dwarf planet by the IAU, with much controversy worldwide. The New Mexico House of Representatives recognized longtime resident and discoverer Tombaugh as a local hero, declaring that Pluto would always be considered a planet to the state of New Mexico, and establishing March 13, 2007 as Pluto Planet Day. Tombaugh was born in Illinois, the Senate of which passed a similar resolution in his honor. Today, the debate continues, reignited annually at the I Heart Pluto Festival, hosted by, you guessed it, the Lowell Observatory, with lectures, speeches, and events. Even as the focus of such intense scientific and cultural debate, Pluto has enjoyed relative privacy over the years, escaping much distinct resolution by any telescopes from Earth, including Hubble, until 2015, when the New Horizons probe swung by. As part of NASA's New Frontiers program, New Horizons was launched in 2006 with the primary mission to visit Pluto and other distant objects afterwards. After the Pioneers and Voyagers, New Horizon is only the fifth man-made object ever to achieve the escape velocity required to exit the solar system completely. After nearly 10 years of spaceflight, most of which was spent in hibernation to save power, New Horizons arrived on July 14, 2015, passing about 7,800 kilometers above the surface of the planet. The spacecraft is powered by a thermoelectric generator, which uses the heat generated by the radioactive decay of pellets of, surprise, plutonium isotope 238. With a half-life of 87.7 years, the payload of 21 and a half pounds of plutonium 238 will power the instruments of New Horizons well into the 2030s. And there are instruments aplenty. Among the impressive scientific payload of New Horizons are long-range cameras for snapping high-resolution pictures, spectrometers for measuring photons and electrons to determine chemical composition, an ultra-stable crystal oscillator used to detect radio waves, and even a dust collector built by students and named after Venetia Burney, the schoolgirl who suggested the name Pluto. With this impressive array of gadgets trained on Pluto, data began to pour in for the anxiously awaiting scientists. Among the first information received included high-resolution photographs of the planet, the first ever to be seen by humans. They showed a frozen world, but not encased entirely in ice. A large reddish-brown area capped its northern pole, 
with much of the icy white areas devoid of impact craters, suggesting recent resurfacing. The spectrophotometer on board, named ALICE, analyzed the atmosphere in two ways. First, by analyzing air glow, or atmospheric molecules emitted by Pluto, and then by watching background stars dim as they pass behind the planet. The other spectrophotometers sampled the high atmosphere and tested its interaction with the solar wind. What they found was a tenuous atmosphere of mostly nitrogen, methane, and carbon monoxide, which is being blown away by the solar wind as quickly as it's generated by the sublimation of ice on the surface. The pressure is extremely low, about 100,000 to 1 million times less than what we experience here on Earth. The dispersion of the atmosphere actually cools the planet even further, much like sweating keeps your body cool on a hot day. The temperature can vary quite a bit due to changes in distance over the course of Pluto's long orbit, and a strong axial tilt contributes to a wild seasonal shift. But at the equator, temperatures can drop as low as negative 240 degrees Celsius, or negative 400 degrees Fahrenheit, at which temperature nitrogen is frozen as solid as rock here on Earth. As the probe passed behind Pluto as observed from Earth, scientists used the communications array as a beacon signal, determining the diameter of the dwarf planet and confirming the atmospheric density and composition. Although one moon of Pluto, Charon, had been identified in 1978 by American astronomer James Christie, New Horizons discovered four more satellites. Charon is by far the largest, and the only one in hydrostatic equilibrium, weighing one-eighth the mass of Pluto at about half the volume. The Pluto-Charon system is technically identified as a binary, because the gravitational center point, or barycenter, around which the bodies orbit, is actually located outside of Pluto. In other words, instead of the moon orbiting the planet, the moon and the planet both orbit a central point between them. Charon was also imaged in detail by New Horizons, sporting its own dark polar cap, which is informally known as Mordor by the spacecraft science team. Charon is much darker, lacking the obvious glare of white ice, but data indicate that it is in fact composed of about 45% water ice, with the rest being rock. One mysterious feature identified on the surface is called Kubrick Mons, or informally, the mountain in the moat. Rising three to four kilometers high, this peak sits within a depression, almost resembling a pebble pressed into putty. Scientists are stumped as to how it may have formed, but maybe from the collapse of a cryovolcano? The other moons of Pluto are tiny in comparison. Kerberos and Styx, the smallest at less than 20 kilometers across, with Nix and Hydra larger at about 50 kilometers across. The satellites are believed to have been created by a collision between Pluto and another Kuiper Belt object, causing a massive ejection of material that eventually coalesced into a ring system and later the moons themselves. The nearly circular orbits support this theory rather than the possibility of a captured collection of Kuiper Belt objects. Before we continue our journey beyond Pluto, let's pop down and see what conditions are like for a visiting human. First, we'll choose our landing zone. I suggest the relatively smooth Sputnik Planitia. This area is known as the western lobe of a heart-shaped feature called the Tomba Regio, and consists of a thousand kilometer wide basin of frozen nitrogen and carbon monoxide ice. The ice forms polygonal cells believed to be convection cells, like tiny tectonic plates carrying blocks of floating water ice to their margins to be subducted. Here you would find an environment pretty much as you expect, imagining a desolate frozen desert world so far away from the sun. As we step onto the ice, our eyes have to adjust to the dimness. The sun is only about 1 40th the size we're used to on Earth, shrouding the planet in a perpetual dark twilight. The good news is we can count on the daylight, or what passes for daylight here, for a long time as each day on Pluto lasts almost six and a half Earth days. Under our feet are thick pieces of water ice thought to be floating atop an ocean of liquid water, which covers a large silicate rock core. In 2016, a study was published that hypothesized the ice was formed as a result of liquid water upwelling from below after a massive collision. On the western side of our landing zone, we can find flat plains full of huge dunes each rising as high as a kilometer from the plain floor. Instead of sand, these dunes consist of tiny particles of methane ice blown here by the thin atmosphere from the center of the planitia. We may even witness a cryovolcano here on the planitia, 
either Wright Mons or Picard Mons. Both have been identified as candidates for cryovolcanism, but as yet none has been directly observed. If we were to continue westward, we would eventually reach the reddish-brown polar cap. Here there's still ice, but we would find the darkened color due to organic compounds. These compounds are called tholins, cooked with stellar radiation from the sun until they turn almost black, and are believed to have been a precursor to organic life back on Earth. Charon shares these same compounds in its own dark polar cap. Rounding out our tour, we'll visit the Tartarus Dorsa in the western part of the Northern Hemisphere. Here is a chain of mountains rising half a kilometer high each, with a distinctive scale or tree bark pattern. These structures are interesting because they have not yet been discovered anywhere in the solar system besides Earth. These icy depressions are surrounded by spires formed by erosion, growing only when the planet's atmosphere increases during the extended chill during the winter. As we return to our spacecraft, we can reflect on the wealth of knowledge we have about this tiny frozen world, almost completely mysterious to us less than a decade ago. The advances made possible by New Horizons have been groundbreaking, and will only continue as the probe continues its voyage farther out into the Kuiper Belt. Following a report from New Horizons that the spacecraft is healthy and whole after visiting Pluto, a planet-wide search began on Earth to identify new possible Kuiper Belt objects, or KBOs, for possible future visits. With the renewed search turning up over 140 KBOs of potential interest, three were designated as potential targets for future visits. One such, known as 486958 Arakoth, or more conveniently as PT-1 for potential target 1, was chosen as the next destination. PT-1 appeared to be about 30 to 45 kilometers across, and it consists of a contact binary or two connected lobes. By the time the flyby occurred in 2019, it had been renamed Ultima Thule, a combination of ancient Greek and Latin terms, acquiring the metaphorical meaning of a distant place beyond the borders of the known world. New Horizons will continue its study of the Kuiper Belt until its equipment fails, observing between 25 to 35 more KBOs in the foreseeable future. But there are a handful of objects we know about that are worth a closer look on our journey today. Closest in size to Pluto is the dwarf planet Eris, slightly smaller but actually more massive than Pluto. Following a widely eccentric orbit, Eris can travel as close as 38 AU, or astronomical units. One AU is the distance of the Earth to the Sun. At its most distant, Eris is almost three times farther away, at 98 AU. Upon discovery in 2004, Eris was called the 10th planet, before the IAU reclassified both it and Pluto as dwarf planets. The previous year, a very unique dwarf planet was discovered and named Haumea, after the Hawaiian goddess of childbirth and fertility. Two moons were discovered and named for the daughters of the goddess, Hi'iaka and Namaka. The most striking characteristic of Haumea is that it rotates at incredible speed around its axis. One rotation takes only four hours, the fastest spin yet recorded of any large object in the solar system. This spinning is so rapid that the dwarf planet cannot maintain a spherical shape, instead elongating to look like a flattened football turning end over end, possibly even threatening its status as a dwarf planet for not being able to maintain a spherical shape. Makemake is another dwarf planet, which was discovered along with Eris in 2005 by a team of astronomers led by American Michael E. Brown. Only about two-thirds the diameter of Pluto, Makemake averages an extremely chilly negative 230 Celsius, likely consisting mainly of methane and ethane ice. Gong Gong, or technically 225088 Gong Gong, was discovered later in 2007. Little is known about this object yet, but it's likely a dwarf planet locked in orbital resonance with Neptune. The extremely eccentric orbit of this object can take it as far away from the Sun as 101 AU. It's thought that Gong Gong contains extensive deposits of organic tholins due to its red color. Readings of light have also indicated that water ice is present which could indicate cryovolcanic activity at some point in the past. Even more distant, 12 minor planets that can reach distances up to 150 AU from the Sun have been identified, which are known as Extreme Trans-Newtonian Objects, or ETNOs, due to their orbits lying so far outside the boundary of Neptune's orbit. 
There is stiff competition for valuable exploration resources, but more missions have been proposed to extend our understanding of Pluto and other trans-Newtonian objects even further. One such proposed by a member of the New Horizons team, Carly Howitt, is called Persephone, after the wife of Pluto. This mission would include an orbital component to remain around Pluto, collecting even more data than is possible during a flyby. New Horizons has demonstrated how valuable such a mission can be. A decade ago, even an imaginary visit to Pluto as detailed as the one we enjoyed today wouldn't have been possible. We simply didn't know enough to make many informed guesses. But thanks to the scientists, engineers, and students that contributed to the mission, there is enough data to keep us busy for decades to come. I hope you've enjoyed our visit to Pluto and the Kuiper Belt today. There's still more of the solar system for us to explore. All the dark hulks of ice and rock, comets and asteroids circling the sun. As we saw today, there are more bands of these smaller objects than just the asteroid belt, and we'll explore all of them next week to see what mysteries they might hold. In the meantime, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Settle the Stars is available on pretty much every podcasting platform, and we're also mirroring our episodes on YouTube at youtube.com slash edgeworksentertainment. And be sure to ring that bell so you know when there's a new episode. We also have a Patreon page at patreon.com slash edgeworksentertainment, where you can get early episodes and tons of other great rewards. The support of listeners like you is what makes this show possible, and I am so grateful to the people who have already joined. And be sure to leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to us. Leaving a review is the single simplest thing you can do to help support the podcast. Thank you all for listening, and as always, happy terraforming. Settle the Stars is a proud member of the Edgeworks Nebula, a collection of intriguing and informative podcasts from Edgeworks Entertainment. Edgeworks Nebula.